Today on the Stepping Out series, we have Rachel Bieber, the founder of Food and Courage, a cookie company that helps end sex trafficking one dozen at a time. She talks about her origin story. 22, I was living in San Francisco. How calling makes you go the extra mile. Mondays and Wednesdays, I would bake off and deliver my entire route before I hit my day job at 8 a.m. The power of your word. I speak a lot of life over myself. And how courage is the secret to everything. This is an incredibly inspirational podcast that you are not gonna wanna miss. Hey, Food and Courage is pretty phenomenal. Um, Thank you. And I think, um, you know, a big, a big reason we do, I, I, I do these podcasts that I mentioned to you before is sometimes I think as believers, or even if you don't categorize yourself as a believer, sometimes you think that if you have a passion for something or if you have a heart for something, you need to go after it in a certain way. Um, but I love the fact that you break the mold with what you do. And so... Yeah, I'd just love to hear from you. Like, what was your story? What's the origin story of Food and Courage? What is it? And yeah. Absolutely. Well, I love your Stepping Out series. I think it's so incredibly powerful. It's truly the catalyst between what's in our hearts and the ability to truly step into our purpose is that step in that series of how to step out. So I just love what you're doing. I think it's so incredibly powerful. I'm so honored to be here. Food and Courage is a cookie company that helps end sex trafficking. So we sell these beautiful shaved chocolate chunk cookies, mold and salt. They're they're very good. Thank you. Anna Gray was there in the beginning seasons of Food and Courage, so it was definitely came to life during a season that we 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 were close and knew one another in San Francisco. So since then, the company has evolved in so many ways. We donate to help end sex trafficking. We raise a lot of awareness. Um, Ultimately, you know, one of the most helpful things you can do to help end an epidemic is education, right? Education is just like everything. You can raise all the money in the world and try to change people's lives in every way. But teaching people, teaching the next generation about how to end sex trafficking, specifically relevant to culturally where they are in the world, that's gold. Um, So Mm. Food and Courage started. I learned what sex trafficking was when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked in a way that it really gripped me and clearly in a way that like never left my soul um not in a traumatic way just in like a deep caring aching way of like man i am unbelievably blessed to be in the world that i live in with the parents i live in i have amazing parents um you know and if i was if if i was her what would i possibly want someone else to do to get me out of that situation so Time goes on. I'm 13 when I learned, right? And, you know, I did 821 walks and that sort Mm -hmm. of stuff. But um, it truly started. I was 22. I was living in San Francisco. And, you know, I think we were learning a lot about how to use what's in your hands. Mm -hmm. And I think I just really looked around my home one day and I saw flour and sugar and um, I'm a professionally trained chef. I went to school for it. I've been cooking for forever. Um, And I was like, what's something that's scalable? What's something that's scalable that I could use to genuinely make an impact? So cookies really ended up being that vehicle. Truly, they're a catalyst uh, to an end to a means. Um, So I spent nine months and I recipe tested this amazing shaved chocolate chunk cookie, mulled salt. Took me a long time. You know, the whole thing has been like step by step in every way. And I, I made this delicious cookie. I tested it on all my friends. I remember I had this massive piece of, piece of paper that took up a wall of my apartment in San Francisco. And I just constantly wrote out notes on this cookie, this one oh, cookie. Wow. I just wanted it to be so excellent. <laughs> hmm. um, you know, and then I think I've had my very first moment of stepping out. I made sample boxes and I made a little survey on like monkey survey or something and I printed out QR codes and I attached them (laughs) and I I I took them to every cafe within walking distance and then just every Saturday for months I would work my way out on the cafes on the circuits anybody who would talk to me I would knock on the door and I would give them cookies and I would say please sell my cookies I want to help end sex trafficking (laughs) and um, sorry sorry what was the reaction of the cafe owners when you said that 
Um, you know, I think it's ideal to be in San Francisco as a young entrepreneur. People were yes. willing to listen to me. You know, I got thrown out a bunch. That's part of the deal. Um, I don't know why. Part of my personality. I just, I'm here for that. I love a good no. Say no. Let's talk about it. Kick me out. Whatever. I don't care. Yep. Um, but I think there was like a lot, a lot of interest via the cause. You know, I think the cause yes. helped sell the cookies, but ultimately the cookies were helping the cause. So it was a very symbiotic relationship. Um, mm -hmm. People were interested. I, I got a lot of, I got a lot of clients that way. I built up probably mm -hmm. half of my client base by cold pitching people. Um, and so usually people were either interested or they just already had a cookie vendor and they didn't want to talk. <laughs> it's right. usually one of two. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. I could, I could definitely imagine how, you know, how when, when you go and pitch it and you say it's cookies, but really it's to help educate people. Yeah. I could definitely imagine that's something so alluring for people. I think more than ever, right? People want to be like, they want to buy from people who have a bigger story that are part of something much bigger than that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think something else I learned and have like learned since that season is that sex trafficking is it's, it's horrible. It's like a hard conversation. because It's a very traumatic issue. Mm -hmm. And, um, B, if people don't know how to help a problem or they don't know how to talk about a problem, then we then we don't because it's like, A, it's not a daily conversation and B, there just has to be um, a bridge that you can gap. And I think mm. I've always seen food as like a very spiritual thing. Uh, mm. Oftentimes in the Bible, like the Lord will like prepare a small supernatural meal while someone is sleeping and totally. they wake up and they eat the food and it continues them on their journey. Like I think food is just such a powerful bridge for people wow. in general. And I think there's a lot to be said for it. But, you know, if you're like, hey, if you buy wow. these cookies, you can help end this problem that is catastrophic and otherwise wow. is pretty hard to approach. It's um, yeah, it's an easy process. Yeah. And, you know, it's actually fascinating. The more that I'm thinking about it is that, like you said, it is such a hard conversation and it's like. No pun intended, but it kind of sweetens the conversation a little bit, you know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> and. And it's like stuff that's kind of hard to talk about. Like this actually, I'm sure it's just like you said, food opens doors to tough conversations. Yeah. And so, you know, I get, I guess, I, and again, what I was talking about before, where traditionally, right? Like if someone had a heart for ending uh, sex trafficking, what would be, what would people think? They're like, oh, well, I need to learn how to be a public speaker. I got to go do a bunch of protests. Right. To, which is which is there is a lot of merit to that mm -hmm. but not everyone mm -hmm. enjoys protesting not everyone sure. enjoys doing massive public speak uh speeches but this is such a cool way where it does open a conversation and i actually feel like not, it'd be well received right in a lot of ways when yeah. you're having these conversations yeah who doesn't want cookies and while you're eating the cookie totally it's gonna take you at least seven seconds to chew that first bite that's seven seconds i've got like <laughs> absolutely you know and i'm not you never say never but like i'm i wouldn't consider myself equipped to like go and like get girls out of sex trafficking i certainly at this point know a lot of amazing people who mm -hmm. run those crews and it's an incredible thing but it's it's not me um mm -hmm. and so like what is me what like what that's is that right. And I think like that first stepping out is the courage to just really understand yourself and really ask yourself what your, what your strengths are. And, you know, if you're willing to like discover that part about yourself and then like lean into it, I think that's like your first step of stepping out is that, that courage is just really, really fine combing through your identity. Yeah. That's awesome. It's so true. Hey, use your strengths, whatever you have, and yeah. then use it again right like you said at, uh, at the beginning what's in your hand it's like what's in your heart and what's in your hand yeah use what's in your hands to fulfill what's in your heart so good. and it's pretty straightforward after that hey yeah. um <laughs> that's very cool um what are so when you were first stepping out um and, and trying out food and courage what what are some like challenges you faced Oh, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it was time. So once I landed all of those cafes, I 
needed a space to make cookies out of, which is again, like another cold pitch. I got connected with someone. I knocked on this woman's door who owned a restaurant in the mission. And she ended up letting me use her space uh, before Mm. and after her hours, which was like 14 hours. So I basically had like really early in the mornings. Um, So then it was like producing the products. Like, okay, I have to, I've got this. I have to produce it legally. Um, So I think my next challenge was for a long time. And I'm sure like, it's so funny on a gray. We really knew, like we were really cross paths a lot in this season, but I used to bake all of my dough in between serving services on a Sunday. I made all of my dough and (laughs) scooped it. And then Mondays and Wednesdays, I would bake off and deliver my entire route around San Francisco before I hit my day job at 8 (laughs) a.m. That's not so you were working at this time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I always food. Yeah, I always worked my day job. So I was always um, working on food styling crews. What? That that's actually nuts. The fact that you're still doing your day job and then you decided to take this up not knowing and, and I mean of course it doesn't even sound like you did it for the paycheck. I did. Even didn't. though I know you love business. I do. Um, <laughs> I actually oh. in that entire season reinvested everything back into the company. Um wow. so it was always like in that in that season, it was always I really believe that there's so much sacrifice that comes out of calling. I think sometimes we think, you know, we're going to step into our calling and it's going to be beautiful. And I do think it's going to be beautiful. But I think part of really being in your calling is like absolutely sacrificing everything you have before the Lord constantly. And in that season, like it was a lot of my time and I'm grateful. I was San Francisco. I was there from like 21 to 25. Like I, you know, I had, you know, I still like it was just such a great season to be hustling quote unquote yeah. that hard. And at the same time, you know, I think I learned a lot about spiritual rest in that season. I I really learned about the spiritual rest of a Sabbath. And then I I got to a point where I really ended up taking a Sabbath really religiously. And mm-hmm. it was this unbelievable spiritual rest and it blessed my company again and again. I eventually started picking up um a lot of we work contracts and doing larger tech parties or like larger like tech companies, Christmas parties and such. Um so yeah, I think yeah. that like that second part of stepping out is like the courage to like dream it and then to constantly mm. dream everything bigger and know that at some point you're going to be exhausted and in that tiredness someone's going to give you a hard no and it's going to really hurt. <laughs> what 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 motive because that's a lot of sacrifice Rachel. Like it was no one asked you to do this. True. What 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 made you go the extra mile between day job i know how much you served we were in the same church i know how much you served there yeah and yeah i did day job what made you keep going for it yeah i i think i've always been like this but i have this like massive drive inside of me to build something bigger than myself i need it to like outlast me and i really like I remember I made this piece of paper and I put it on the door frame of my bedroom. So every day when I left, I touched the piece of paper and mm. I, I left and, you know, it'd be about like 530 in the morning, which is great. And <laughs> it just had like a few key things that I spoke over myself. And it was just like these like prophetic like prophecies of like wellness and abundance. And like, I think the mm. last line was like. <sighs> I, I'm sure I'm, I know it was just like, like you will see like sex slavery abolished and like wow. you are, you are, you're the food. No, I know what it was. It was food encourages ending sex trafficking. Wow. And I think every day when you wake up and I physically saw that line and I touched it before I left my room, I was like, I could labor so much more if I knew that mm. I was getting girls out of that situation. Like it's genuinely such a deep, passion yeah. inside of me and to know that like my labor was microscopic compared to the pain and i think the the deeper the education goes and you know i've been so privileged to meet when meet people coming out of trafficking um and to like learn and know people more and more close and i just man i i just know that i just i have so much more to give and that you know when you have mm. like a, a spiritual calling in your life like the stamina will be there. Like the endurance will be there if you continually pull from the right well. If you quit pulling from the right well, you're in big trouble. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <It's> over. 
No, I think there's so many amazing things that you said that I think, firstly, it's like, when you find out where you're passionate about, and what you believe your passion is, and then you somehow align that to work, like, again, like the energy it gives you the drive it gives you is unreal. So it's like, I think it's just such a huge encouragement for people to find what their passion is and try mm -hmm. aligning their life to it. And I think number two, what you did pretty well is that, I mean, pretty well was a pretty low bar. What you did very well <laughs> is that is the fact that you didn't allow the excuse of I have a day job to not stop you from getting after this thing that you felt so deeply for, right? Yeah. And, and it, it, you know what? It's kind of the truth in life. If you really want something, you'll make it happen. It, yeah. It's just is the reality, right? If you really want it, you will give up Netflix. If you really want it, you will give up X, Y, and Z. And yeah. you, we've got to choose our things. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that you wrote that food and courage will end sex uh, slavery. Yeah. Um, I have a similar sort of thing that I read in the morning. I got it from Craig Rochelle. And one of the lines that he says in the confessions, it says that what I do today matters. Uh. And I think that's like, that's it. Hey, just every mm -hmm. single day waking up and being like, all right, what I do today actually matters. It mm -hmm. makes a change and makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that only happens, right? Once you actually allow yourself mm -hmm. to get consumed by the, by the passion or by yeah. the calling. Yeah, you um, have to want it. That's amazing. Hey, what other, uh, what other little habits did you have? <laughs> well, I was about to say that's an amazing atomic habit is like the first thing that I thought. It's an amazing atomic habit. Um, mm -hmm. What other habits? That's a really good question. Uh, I, my biggest one is that I speak a lot of life over myself. And that's I think cool. it's really important. I'm sure you've heard it me say it many times, but I use the phrase I receive that like quite often. Um, <laughs> yes. And I still do because like it was not like a cool thing for me. I like really mean it in the mm. same way that like sometimes wow. people say something and I'm like, I don't receive that. So was it intentional for you or is it just like something you've always said? Um, That was, you know, it's funny. It was out of that season, but I don't know. I learned something in my spirit, in my readings in that season that like that just became like a natural trigger for me. And I still feel that way about it. I really believe that if we looked at a, cu a currency, so say that words are a currency, say that words are, say words are like dollar bills. So say mm. that you say something really generous over me and you're like, Rachel, I just think what you're doing is so powerful. You know, it's amazing. And I'm just like, no, 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 Anna Gray. Like, no, like I'm working on it. There's so much more to come. Like, it's not good yet. I think that's a lot of people's really natural tendency. It's just be like, oh, no, no, no. Like we, we can really brush things off. And if you looked at it like a currency for the sake of an analogy, yep. it's like leaving a lot of money on the table, right? Yep. And just passing, like pushing it all away, which mm. just like really hurts that like wealth mindset that I really believe we're biblically called to. But compared mm. to like receiving like the words of people over you that like the Lord is using to say, you know, like we have amazing people in our life who are speaking so much life to receive it over yourself. Like, Man, it's so healthy. But I, I to this day, like when I'm in a hard season, when I run, I just constantly like say words that I know that the Lord is saying over me, especially if like my brain is hard. If my brain is having a hard time and I'm hearing what is not the Lord over my life, I just I will, I will yeah. constantly speak out the truth constantly. I think my parents must have taught me something similar to that when I was young. My dad was really good about um like people and spaces and, you know, being in a healthy space. He was really good about that. I think he's always had like great discernment. So yeah. I'm, I must have picked it up in my childhood. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I yeah. think it is, it's so true that, hey, the power of your words and the it's, environment. I yeah. think it's, it's, it's really interesting. I don't know if you've uh, read this book, um, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Mm -mm. Okay. And in short, what he says is we're more product of our environment than we actually give ourselves credit for. Oh, sure. And which is tough to hear as a North American person, because we love being so independent, right? Like we're just <laughs> like, I'm self-made, I'm this. Yeah, for sure. I'm not denying anyone's hard work. But for example, he spoke about how, of course, Bill Gates worked super hard. But he was also the son of an ultra wealthy father and mother who mm -hmm. had access and he was in a private school in Seattle that had access to computers at a time where 
other places didn't. And he had access to coding and had one-on-one -on -one access to computers when no one else did, mm -hmm. only him. And his mom was also a big part of like, as he got more interested in his mom helped some funding for it and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. essentially he got, he had extra benefits to him. So I say all that to say is that if we are a product of our environment, mm -hmm. we need to be very conscious of our environment. And I know that I, I, I totally believe and I'm with everyone. Like I'm, I'm the type of person where like, I want to thrive despite the odds. Right. Yeah. Like, you put me anywhere in the world, like, I believe I'll find a way to thrive just because yeah. that's the way I'm. But we can be very smart as well, right? Sure. So with our friends, right? And with our words, especially with our words, right? We have control over the words that are going mm -hmm. as spoken over us and with the stuff we're putting into our minds. So we can actually build out that environment yeah. in our mind. And eventually, we put those words in and then eventually those words will shape us. Yeah. And um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Words really shape us. I also really love what you were saying um, with Bill Gates, like the influence also just like such an incredibly well-read man. I mean, um, I've yeah, very, of like, course, I can't, you can't deny that. Oh, no, for sure. I just like I watched an interview one time and I was like, oh, my goodness, the stamina, which so I just I was the information, you know, is like the same way that like we listen to podcasts now and like the series mm -hmm. that you're putting out is just like so incredible, like to be able to like listen to all of like I personally I read. I like to read. I'm pretty dyslexic. I love a good audiobook. You know, those <laughs> words coming over us, Me like too. so important. Yes. Um, and the people. I'm incredibly grateful, especially, you know, San Francisco. I just really have the most amazing friends. I'm still really close with all my friends from San Francisco. And, yeah. you know, those are people who really pushed me in those seasons. You know, those early mornings, those late nights, they had my back, like just wow. so much, so much blessing yeah. in all of the right people around. Yeah. So yeah, it's incredibly important, hey, yeah. building the environment. Um, I wanted to ask you something. I guess this is even more for myself. So you, you've you been in business definitely longer than I have. This is more of a newer world for me in the sense of I've not really, I mean, I've always had an interest in it, but really got into it over the year and a half with my coaching yeah. business. Okay, you spoke about the wealth mindset as a believer. Talk to me about that because... <laughs> It's tough in, in, in the sense of, you know, like there's much that's said about greed and money and in, in scriptures, like how do you reconcile all of that mm -hmm. as a believer? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. Um, it's, it's a really, really good question, you know, and I think I've, re I've thought about that a lot over the years, but ultimately... I think the Lord really calls us to be good business wo women and men. And I believe mm. that like with that comes the ability to generate those funds that ultimately we use as tools as we go out in the world. Like I really believe the Lord calls us to do that really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that almost not taking advantage of it. I don't want to use a strong word, but it's a bummer. In the sense that we have so many resources, like not only do we have the resources of the information that is in the world mm -hmm. today to be able to stand on top of it, but we have like the Holy Spirit inside of us that we listen to. Like there are moments where like I hear the Lord speaking and I'm like, that's the wrong contractor for this or like that's the wrong client or like this business is this deal is not going to take you where you, it needs to take you you know like yeah. the wisdom in that man that takes so well like so so far solomon the wealthiest man in the world like the story of the talents um the master mm -hmm. with the talents like he was well pleased with the servant that came back and like doubled his profitability or like the servant that wow. like brought him interest but like the servant who buried it that's that's a poverty mindset right that's a poverty mm -hmm. mindset to like um not not step out into your calling mm -hmm. it can be wealth it can be anything else money is like one yeah. currency if you will right like yeah um you know like the master yeah. was like angry with him because ultimately he didn't mm. use what was in his hands you get like he, the master gave him so much potential to make as much to step up mm. in the world to have more influence everyone else like went up in rank and more influence and they get to keep growing but you know that like that servant didn't and yeah. I really believe that like we are called to generate wealth and wisdom and knowledge and influence and like everything else you know like that's also yeah. very equally um 
kindness and empathy and like servanthood and generosity. Like I really believe that they're, they're all equal. Um, Mm. But it is funny. Biblically, we get really hung up on like, is it okay to, is it okay to be wealthy? And or want to be wealthy to want to be wealthy. Yeah. What's the difference? No, that's right. Like what is the difference between wanting to be wealthy and being wealthy? Yeah. 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 I think, I think that when it's your only focus, that's where you lose is like when wealth is your only focus, that's when it, there's like a shift in your brain. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's when we lose just like anything else. When, when anything else becomes an idol, we lose. And I think it has less with like the Lord losing and more to do with the fact that like we have one life and the Lord gives us so many tools and to not use them or step out to them is, is disappointing in the same world that like focusing on greed compared to wealth. Yeah. Would be disappointing because I actually don't think that they're parallel. I don't think yeah. there is greed in being wealthy. I think they're mm-hmm. two completely different mindsets. I just think it's like yeah. how the enemy is skewed. Yeah. And I guess like anything, right? Like even if you're in ministry, for example, like myself, it can also end up being an idolatrous thing if you let it. You know sure. what I mean? It's like nothing, nothing is inherently good i think you make it good or bad right so like the pursuit of wealth like for you right you're doing it well number one your cookies are helping sex trafficking but then mm-hmm. also i'm 100 percent sure even with what you accumulate it's going back into good things mm-hmm. um and so yeah so you know what's actually really interesting when you're talking about the story the talent story i never realized before because i think I feel like sometimes you hear more about Christians talking about saving versus investing. Mm-hmm. And then I just realized in that story as well, the master said that you could have at least put it in like a, essentially a savings interest. Yeah. Bank, so we'd at least make back something. Yeah. And how doubling on the wealth you actually have. I mean, there's so many metaphors that that story goes towards, but if we were to use it strictly financially, mm-hmm. um, just keeping it away and not putting it to work mm-hmm. was seen as wicked. Yeah. Which is, fa- which is fascinating, right? <laughs> some, yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. It is really interesting, but like we were called to live in abundance in mm-hmm. the garden. Of Eden, that's all that there ever was. I think yeah. in a lot of ways that it was, you know, it's part of the fall to yeah. lose your mindset of, living under an open heaven Mm. what's um when you what what are your favorite business books or business resources like where do you feel like you learned all (laughs) this stuff okay um one of my favorite books is called the go-giver which i highly yes i've heard about it i love the go-giver i also love supernatural business it's a really good especially if you want to mix um business and spirituality um those are those are probably as far as books go, some of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Um and then I love podcasts. I mean, I I can just plow through how I built this and listening to founder stories does two things. A, it makes me feel like in hard seasons everything's gonna be okay because every founder has a wild story with some dips. That's right. <laughs> And B, it really teaches me avoidable mistakes. Like if I can find someone else with a really similar business model and just really listen to their story and then go research who they are, that's great. And then thirdly, um, I mean, I'm always, always trying to take a call with somebody who's just like so far ahead of me in life, in my world. If how do you get those me, calls? How do I get those calls? Mm-hmm. Is that, was that a question? Yep. Um, a couple of different ways. I'm grateful for my day job. I still have a day job, which I love. Um, and that takes food and courage significantly farther. I work as a private chef and for years I freelanced in food styling. So I got to cook the food for um, television, cookbooks, marketing, all of that. And it constantly, that job, both of those jobs constantly put me in really interesting, diverse rooms with mm. really influential people. And so I always have the ability to kind of put it out there. If I have a need, you got to go for no, like you got to, <laughs> which is, you know, you know, my best friend, you got to, you got to just shoot your shot and be like, you know what? I really need 
this right now. Hey, I'm having this hang up in my co-packer. It's food and courage scale to have a co-packer. And like, I'm having this hang up. I don't know how to handle it. I'm actually really out of my league in my operations. If you just drop that in rooms, hmm. people's natural reaction is to give you a solution. So they're like, oh, you know, I have a, I know a guy who's in this realm and I just immediately, oh, do they have 15 minutes to take a call with me? I'd love to follow up. What's the best way that they want to That's communicate? Great. That's great. That's great. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for like the rooms that I continue to get mm. to, to get in via work. And mm. a lot of that is still cold calling, knocking on doors, constantly asking people if they can connect me with the person that they know. It's just always asking. It's like the courage yeah, to just awesome. always ask for what you need and what you want. And more often when you do, like people, people really give it to you. And like you will get a lot of no's first. You'll get a lot of no's. And I think there can be moments of just like uncomfortableness or embarrassment or like whatever, but they're fleeting. And like it's just, it's just not that big of a deal. It's so good to ask. And I think like very good. Probably all of my greatest breakthroughs have come through that. Yeah. Yeah. What's the what's the future of food and courage? It's a really good question. Thanks for asking, Anna Gray. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to catch the story up. We left off in San Francisco. I have big WeWork partnerships. I'm doing large Christmas parties for major tech companies like Adobe. Um, I'm in all of my cafes. I'm in a routine. I'm selling hundreds and hundreds of cookies a week. I'm doing one flavor. I only ever built one flavor. 2020, the pandemic hits. I lose. Mm -hmm. I think at that time I was working Food and Courage. I was working in private chefing for like food and I was food styling. So like I'm working. I lost all of my jobs. It's all over. Wow. I lost everything. All of my income streams. And um I really like took a minute and I looked at the company and I recognized what I was doing was not sustainable and how I didn't want the company to operate and how I didn't want to scale and I shut it down for a little bit for months. I mean, none of the cafes were open no, like nobody was you know, I could sell a few orders here and there, but I wasn't in a place probably mentally or intellectually to like scale online. Um, mm -hmm. I would have needed to like hire out. And I think I was pretty burned out. I really just like needed a minute and I took it yeah. and I'm grateful. Um, in that season, I asked myself a series of very personal, very vulnerable questions about why, um, why have I not moved it farther than I already have? Like, mm. what is holding me back from really scaling food and courage to be whatever? And one of the big answers I got out of that is that <laughs> I didn't want to sell a product that was directly related to all of America's leading causes of death, which is sugar, um, which is a crazy revelation from like a chef baker who owns a thriving cookie company. Um, so I did my research and That's I, via private good. chefing, already had a recipe ready to go that was gluten-free, dairy-free, natural sugars, and was a beautiful, same gooey, chocolatey cookie. But everything was made with a complex sugar compared to a simple sugar. So uh, for example, it's the difference between eating a sugar and an apple compared to a Snickers bar. Very cool. Super different. Yep. Um, which got me into a lot more niche markets. So from there, I did That's the research awesome. on how to scale. And this took me a year. Like it's a process, cold calling a ton of co-packers, somebody who can like run my product through their factory at the thousands, be able to make bulk, um, bulk sales, um, hiring designers to build like my dream packaging, which I now have and it's gorgeous and I'm in love with it. It's this beautiful white tube. It's a perfect executive gift. So the ability to like sell to larger companies in bulk Very just cool. in one shot. That's what I wanted. I desperately needed to stop making the dough. <laughs> um, so that's kind of like caught up. Our product that's has awesome. changed. Our packaging has changed. Uh, where we sell has changed. So coming into like a really exciting season where like Christmas sales are coming up. And if you have a company that does any sort of gifting for your employees or you're in sales and you're sending out all of your gifts to your prospect, like we're a great option for a gift that is delicious without guilt, which a lot of people at the holidays really want to get away from. Um, our mission based, we put encouraging notes in all of our packaging to help like raise health awareness specifically in America, but we can ship elsewhere. So the dream is just like to continue to scale the product and simultaneously continue to create education around 
what sex trafficking is. It's really interesting mm -hmm. to talk to people in different parts of the world because it operates very differently um, in different countries. And ultimately, America is the number one consumer of sex trafficking. It's a billion dollar industry. And really, in America is. America is your number one consumer. I know. Um, Ouch. Yeah, people get sent in. Yeah, sent in for it. So you think it's in a wow. third world country, but it's not. It's here. Um, so continuing to like raise awareness in America about it and doing it through, you know, like wow. we talked about earlier, a really incredible vessel. So we talked wow. about the fact that we donate, which we still donate. We donate to the same organization. We donate to Thorn, uh, which is based out of Oakland, California. At the time, it was my backyard, which I really loved. But uh, they, in a sense, create uh, technology that scans the dark web in order to identify the um, individuals in the content and then uh, have partnerships to be able to create extraction teams. So wow. it's very, very practical. Again, so cool. not in my wheelhouse. Going to school for that in order to help with that would have been irrelevant. Um, but I can bake cookies. So That's right. the dream is to keep scaling, to keep getting to work with larger and larger companies to do bigger and bigger sales and make sure that process is just such an unbelievable blessing for the company and their clients and in turn get to help, you know, women, children, people out of sex trafficking. Yeah. That is amazing. <laughs> Rachel, you're an inspiring person. You're inspiring. Right. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you asked me on no. your podcast. No, of course. <laughs> I think it's just so awesome. Hey, it's kind of like, I don't know how to scan the dark web, but I can make cookies. So yeah. let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Anyone who wants to understand what calling 101 is, Man. that's it. You may not be able to do this, but you can do this. Go do that. Very genuinely, um, anyone who's trying to figure out your passion, look around your home. What do you keep nearby? What do you touch right. every day? I baked every day. Yeah. Super simple. Got to simplify. That's awesome. Hey, <laughs> as we wrap up, what would you say to someone who's kind of been on the precipice of stepping out, but they're super nervous? They don't know if it's going to work. If they don't know all. What would you say to, to them? Yeah. Courage is the name of the game. It is your greatest friend, your biggest asset. You already have everything that you need inside of you to succeed and to be fulfilled in what you're coming into. And as you step out, fear shrinks. It doesn't grow. Mm -hmm. It shrinks. And at some point, you'll get a no. And it might be your first big no. And what you realize is that it's not that big of a deal. You're still going to go to dinner with your same friends. You're still going to sleep in the same house. And life goes on. And so keep your courage close. And don't, be, don't let fear carry what's out there. Your fear shrinks as you continue to step out. It never grows. Well, hey, if you enjoyed that, you're going to want to check out this podcast from a good friend, Tony Ariola, on how a DM led to his dream job. Or you can check out my other good friend, Joey Vantes, who was hooked on alcohol, addicted to drugs, and how he eventually turned his life around to now becoming a billboard topping rapper.